Hello, and welcome to Gunfighter Life, the podcast where we talk about gunfighting the right way with Judeo Christian worldview and values and real world first hand experience. As always, I'm your host, Michael Melito. God is number one in everything and in my life, and this podcast is no different. Today's episode is going to be a hopefully a fun one, thought experiment. Five guns I would pick for, let's call it the end of the world as we know it right now. I'll plug in the bio and then into the main topic. You can skip around three minutes and 45 seconds ahead of wherever I start the bio if you want to skip it. Before you do, don't forget to like, subscribe, leave a review of the podcast. Hit a couple of stars, depending on the app, just write a quick review. Free way that doesn't take a whole lot of time to help out the podcast and hopefully help others find the podcast. To check out more while you're listening, you can go to goodshepherdtraining.com. First and foremost, I am a servant of God. A teacher, a preacher, a fisher of men. God is number one in my life and everything that I do in this podcast is no different. And I don't apologize for that. A little bit about me in the background. I grew up, I guess what you would consider a heathen. Didn't grow up a Christian. But I grew up in the southeastern United States. What most would consider very poor. Hunting and fishing and shooting. Joined the Marine Corps at 17. Did a couple of combat tours in Iraq. After my combat tours in Iraq. I was an urban warfare instructor for the United States Marine Corps under Mojave Viper. I also served in law enforcement for several years in LAPD. I worked patrol assignments and more specialized assignments. Where by God's grace, he got me through some nasty places in this world war zones. And some of the nastiest streets in the country. Not because I am better, because God chose that mercy on me and had a purpose for me. And I'm thankful for that. After my time in law enforcement, I was a private contractor for federal government for a three-letter government agency. I won't specify doing private contracting work. I'm very much involved in guns and gunfighting. I also served in the U.S. Army, both full-time and part-time National Guard. I should say my primary MOS is in both branches of the military or infantry as of one sort or another. Specialized infantry in the Marine Corps and an MOS that no longer exists. I started competition shooting even before I joined the Marine Corps at 17. I won my first gold medal even before I joined the Marine Corps at 17. I've been blessed by God with the talents he's given me to win more shooting competitions than I can remember. I've won most of my competitions in rifle and pistol, but I've also competed in archery and shotgun and even muzzleloader. Knife throwing, hatchet throwing, I've competed in all that. I've also been a professional big game hunter and guide. Like I said, I grew up hunting and and fishing and shooting. I've done it to put meat on the table because I like to put food on the table with the talents God's given me. I don't apologize for that. I've done it as a professional hunter and guide. I've slain all manner of beast and guided for all manner of beast. Bear and wolf and elk and deer. Mule deer, a white-tailed deer, I've slain ram and fallow deer and countless animals. And I don't apologize for that either. FBI certified firearms instructor, NRA, and a bunch of other three-letter government agency certifications. Blessed be the Lord, my rock, who trains my hands for war and my fingers for battle. Psalm 144. I've been blessed to be the commander of a tactical team, an SRT special response team in a large metropolitan area, where our primary job was to stop active shooters. But again, first and foremost, I'm a servant of God, called by God to share the good news, a teacher, a preacher. A fisher of men. With that, we will roll into the day's topic. Okay, five guns for the end of the world as we know it. No, I'm not going to define that. This is a thought experiment. 
Now the book of Daniel, the book of Revelation, Jesus himself talks about great tribulation. But Jesus also says he doesn't know the day or the hour, and I certainly don't know if Jesus doesn't know. He says only the Father knows that. And I don't know what smaller trials and tribulations will come before the great tribulation. I don't know and you don't know. We don't see the future. But hopefully this is just a thought experiment. Could be an EMP. Could be economic collapse. Could be something more akin to the fall of Rome. You know, could be COVID mutates with rabies and we get the actual zombie apocalypse. Again, this is a thought experiment. I don't think that's going to happen. Perhaps it's something as mundane and more plausible that there's some legislation passed that you could only own five guns as an American citizen. And again, I don't see that happening, and I really hope that doesn't happen. But anyway, a thought experiment. The brain working. Well, I guess I'll start with the one you've heard me say before if you've listened to most of the other past episodes. If I had to pick one gun, it'd be my Benelli M2. And granted, <clears throat> this is not my favorite gun. It's not my favorite gun to train with or to hunt with or anything else. But favorite is not the criteria. It's not my favorite five guns. I practice shotgun less than rifle and far, far less than pistol, less than handgun. So why would this be if I can only have one gun, the gun? For practicality, it's the most practical, most versatile small arm a modern man can own. It can hunt anything from a dove to a grizzly bear. Nothing else I want to talk about on the list can do that. When I was living near the wilderness of the Sawtooth Wilderness of Idaho, the, buildest, the biggest wilderness, I believe, anywhere shy of Alaska in the United States. Giant wilderness. And I would go out by God's grace with a pack and a Bible and a shotgun. I'd pick a 12-gauge shotgun. Not the Benelli M2. I didn't have it yet. But that's what I would take to survive. It is the best tool for that, I believe. So that'd be my number one. And let me talk about the Benelli that I chose. I had a Benelli M1 Super 90. I sold it to get a Benelli M4 and I almost immediately regretted it. The Benelli M1 Super 90 was an awesome gun, but it wasn't fit for this task because it didn't take chokes. So I think whatever shotgun you have, it should have the ability to interchange chokes. There's so many good modern shotguns that can take chokes. I don't know why you wouldn't do that. And most of the older guns you can adapt to take chokes. I have my Benelli set up and I have it with two barrels. Now you, if you say that's cheating and I can only have one barrel, that's fine. I have one barrel that stays on it the majority of the time. And that is an, I believe, 18 inch rifle sighted barrel that takes different chokes. I had to order that special that didn't come with the gun. And as I understand that's not a factory option. Those rifle sights are kind of the ones you'd see on the, you know, 50s, 60s, 70s deer hunting rifles. I have quite a bit of shotgunning experience, but a lot of it is as a police officer, and a lot of it is doing things using a shotgun to be aimed instead of pointed like you do with dove hunting. And that rifle barrel lets me do that. Now, I can still point shoot with it. With my Benelli M1 Super 90, I would shoot clays. So it can be done, but it gives you far more accuracy. And if you're hunting things like squirrels and rabbits and deer, I think that's a better option. And certainly a better one for defense. It's meant to be aimed. That Benelli M1 of mine and the Benelli M2 that I have are ridiculously accurate. I mean, I've never measured them for group size because it seems kind of superfluous. The projectile itself is almost an inch wide. But it will put the slugs exactly where I want them at 0 for 50 yards. It's so accurate that if it was a rifle, I would be happy with it. It is ridiculously accurate. So was my Benelli M1 Super 90. But that Benelli M2... It's not super heavy, which is why I got rid of the Benelli M4 and got the M2. It is semi-automatic, which I prefer for any handgun. People will say that pump actions, slide actions, whatever you want to call them, trombone actions are more reliable. In my experience, that's not so. Maybe so mechanically, but if you're super excited and or injured, losing blood, struggling to stay conscious, which could be a real thing, can be a real thing as I can speak from firsthand experience, then you may not, and I've seen in, even in training, you may not pull that action all the way back and push it all the way forward, both of which will cause a malfunction. 
and can cause a pretty bad malfunction if you do a double feed. That's not going to happen with a semi-auto. And if you get a good, reliable semi-auto shotgun, they are ridiculously reliable. Now, I really like the Beretta 1301s, but I chose the Benelli M2 because instead of being gas-operated like a lot of semi-autos, the Mossberg series that I'm aware of and the Beretta series that I'm aware of, those are gas-operated, which has some advantage. They're lighter recoiling. But it also means that you get dirty, nasty gas and carbon fouling and ammunition fouling in the action of the gun, which normally is fine after quite a few rounds you can shoot through it. You just clean it. But if you're in a situation where you can't, that Benelli inertia system keeps that pretty much all the nasty gases in the barrel. And the barrel is chrome lined, just like an AK-47. So it would be hard for me to imagine enough fouling in there to stop that thing from working. It's not in the small parts of the gun like it is with a gas-operated system. And the Benelli M-Series, I believe, all have that inertia system. So anyway, that'd be the first gun that I'd mention. The next one would be my Ruger 1022 takedown. Now, the first gun, I believe, that wasn't given to me, but that I bought with my own money was either a 12-gauge shotgun or this, uh, well, not this exact one, but a Ruger 1022 that I still have that my wife likes to shoot, that I like to shoot. Um... But I don't know, somewhere between, I don't know, six and ten years ago, let's say seven years ago, eight years ago, got their Ruger 1022 takedown. It's pretty much the same thing, but it breaks in half, which obviously if you're only going to have a few guns or in an austere environment, that has its advantages. I don't think I have to explain that. And I thought that maybe it wouldn't be as accurate since it was a takedown, but in my experience, it's as accurate or more accurate than my Ruger, my regular Ruger 1022. Now, depending on the environment, I would also recommend getting in stainless, which you can get the Ruger 1022 in stainless. Get the, I don't know if the takedown's a go or no go, and I don't know that it has to be a Ruger 1022, but I would pick the Ruger 1022. It has a lot of advantages. It's kind of proven as the epitome of reliable, robust, durable 1020 or 22 semi automatics for that matter. Mine has kind of a camo job, mostly because I was going to camo my Scar 17, and I want to start on something that didn't cost a couple of grand first. So I did the Ruger 1022 and kind of a Cryptex camo with the wife as a gun project that came out very well. Uh, I will mention on that, my go-to ammo for that, for like having in the gun, having in the pack with that gun is CCI Mini Mag 36 grains. Now, 22s are kind of finicky. In my experience, the ones that work the best and the broadest amount of guns are the CCI Mini Mags. That doesn't mean they'll work for you. I have mine set up with iron sights. They are really good. I believe they're called tech sights. They're pretty much the same sights that are on like a military rifle akin to an M1 carbine. A good solid peep sight. I have a flip up sight for 50 yards and a flip up sight for 100 yards. They're great sights. They're robust. They have wings on them. Just in case you drop them, which I have many times. And I recently did upgrade the center post to have a fiber optic circle in the middle. Because I did find when I was out hunting with the dog, um, just to get him accustomed to hunting, we were hunting near dusk, that it was hard to see that front sight, especially looking through the rear aperture. So I thought that that fiber optic would be a nice addition. I also hollowed out the buttstock, cut the back of the buttstock so I could put things in the buttstock. That's something I would recommend if you're doing something for a survival rifle. Uh, you know, your one or any kind of rifle, I would really recommend if you're going to take it anywhere other than the range, if you're going to take it out into some environment where that might be all that you have. Next one, talking about the 22, would be my Ruger Mark IV handgun. It's a great gun. It's a great gun for training. Both the 22s that I mentioned, the 1022 and that Ruger Mark IV, they designed them to be able to be dry fired, so I can still use them for dry firing. The 22 handgun that I have, I use that a lot for training. I use it a lot for shooting. I do dry fire with it. And I recently mounted a red dot on it so that I could get used to a custom to red dot. But I think a 22 handgun will be important. If I am, in, if I do still have the ability to train, I would want to train. And that handgunning skills, generally if somebody is a really good handgun shooter, they'll be a good rifle shooter. 
I can't say the same. Somebody, somebody can be a really, really good rifle shooter and be a horrible handgun shooter in my experience. It doesn't work the other way. So if I'm going to train, I'm going to do most of my training with a handgun. And that's a good handgun to train with. So that Ruger Mark IV. Caveat is that mine is heavy. I get it to kind of replicate a 1911, which is one of my common go-to duty guns, carry guns, whatever. It does have the same kind of crossover, but they do make tactical solutions. And I think Ruger themselves make a light version. Um, I think it's called the pack light. I don't know what Ruger calls theirs. Maybe just the light, but it is pretty much a steel barrel with an aluminum barrel shroud to make it lighter. And those are great. And if it was going to be a gun that I was going to carry a long distance or something like that, that might have some real advantages. But for right now, I have it where it is the heavy, full, thick steel barrel, kind of a bull barrel, steel barrel. And I don't really care about it being super thick steel target barrel. I care about it being a similar weight to a regular fighting gun. And that's why I have it that way. But the lighter version would have a lot of advantages. Unfortunately, on the Rugers, the upper, the barrel portion is all one portion, and that is a serialized portion. So you can't just go out and buy another one and have it shipped to your house. You have to do the whole FFL thing. So what are we up to? Three now. Now four is my SCAR-17. SCAR-17 is a fantastic rifle. Uh, took me, I wanted that one of those for a lot, a lot of years. I sold several guns to get it. I was not disappointed. It sits above in my office where I work now. It sits above me in my office in case something should happen. Um, it stays ready. It stays above me. When I was the commander of the SRT team, when I was leading an active shooter team, that was one of my go-to, I guess you would call it EDC rifles. It is a fantastic rifle. Is it the best for every situation or every circumstance? No. Is it light? No, but it's pretty light for a 308 battle rifle. I think 7.7 .7 pounds. And I have mine mounted with a Trigicon AccuPoint 124. A fantastic optic. Fantastic for up close and personal CQB stuff. Fantastic for several hundred yards. I can't say because I've only ever owned one. But the SCAR-17 that I have is ridiculously accurate. You see that as the theme of my guns. If they're not ridiculously accurate, I generally will sell them or trade them off and get another one. And keep the ones that really impress me. The SCAR-17 that I have will put them in one hole at 50 yards. 50 yards is what I zero my pretty much every rifle at. My hunting rifles, my combat rifles, I zero them at 50. They're generally dead on again around 200, 220, 250, depending on the rifle and the load and all a bunch of other factors. It means that I can point and shoot pretty much from 50 to 200 and something yards. And that's what they refer to as my point blank range where I can just point and shoot. But that SCAR-17 is ridiculously accurate. It'll make one ragged hole at 50 yards, which is fine accuracy for a combat rifle. And it's 308. 308 has a lot of advantages. Especially if you're talking about you can only have a few guns. Are ARs awesome? Yeah, they're awesome. I, I shoot ARs a lot. I probably shoot them more than I shoot the SCAR. They're great, but the 223 at its heart is a varmint round. It's a varmint cartridge based on a varmint cartridge. Yeah, we've done a lot of upgrades to it, but at the end of the day, that's basically what it is. 308 does still have a lot of advantages. It has advantages at range. It has advantages on barriers. It has advantages for a hunting round. I haven't hunted with my SCAR-17, to be honest, because I have a lot of purpose-built hunting rifles. But if you told me I was going on an awesome hunt and I had to bring my SCAR-17, I wouldn't be like, oh, man. Is it as light as some of my hunting rifles for spotting and stalking? No, but it's 7.7 .7 pounds. That's as light as a lot of, you know, hunting rifles were 50 years ago. And plenty of people put meat on the table with those. And far more accurate than the average hunting rifle was 50 years ago, for sure. And a much better optic than almost any, than really existed 50 years ago. So I would not at all be disappointed. Again, as I alluded to, took me a long time to save up for that rifle the wife and i got it we did do a camo job on it cryptex with i think dura bake or one of the other brands of that bake on coatings cryptex it came out really nice maybe i'll put a picture of that or i'm not sure exactly what picture i'll put on but hopefully that'll be in there anyway a fantastic rifle for if things did get crazy if there was rioting and looting and things when i was the commander of a tactical team and everything got shut down and there was rioting and looting in a big metropolitan area i would often take that with me to the gym to wherever it would stay with me it would stay by my side 
Praise God, I never had to use it for that, but that was the gun that I picked if that was going to be a thing. Again, for barrier penetration, for distance, and for CQB, it's a fine weapon. Is it always better than an AR? No. Oftentimes, when I was the commander of a special response team, I would have a little AR pistol that I would carry. Why? Because it was lighter and it was handier, and for some things, it would be better. You know, doing vehicle work in and out of a vehicle a lot, things like that. It's not always the best tool for the job, but if I was whittling it down, I would pick that over the AR. 308 has a lot of better loads, especially for hunting. Can you hunt deer with a 223? Yes, I know that you can. And I've gone hunting with people that have, as you as you heard my bio of hunting quite a bit. I know that it can be done, and I know for some people it's not a bad option, but nobody's going to argue that it's a better big game round than 308. Now, 2 3 might be a better varmint round, but I'm not really worried about varmints if we're talking about this kind of environment. And if I did want to do that, I would take the 1022. Which brings us to the last gun. Now, this one was hard. I wanted a center fire handgun. I wanted a center fire handgun, and I have many. That's kind of my bread and butter for competition, for shooting, for practice. It's the gun that I have on me almost all the time is a center fire handgun or, or revolver. So I have a few of them because they're purpose-built tools. But the one that I picked I think is the best all-around option. And that is my Wilson Combat Beretta 92. And I know Beretta 92 gets a lot of hate, but in my opinion, it is the finest combat pistol ever made by human beings. It is a fantastic gun. And I would still want to shoot and train if it was not like the total end of the world. If I could still buy ammo and stuff like that, it was just like a limited to five guns. That gun is reliable enough to be an end of the world tool. It is accurate enough to be a target handgun. It Mine is ridiculously, ridiculously accurate. One of the cool things about the Breda 92, because it has a different operating system than most tilting barrel guns, and I think a better operating system, is it shoots point of aim, point of impact with most loads, whether 115 grain or 147 grain. And if it's a time where I'm not able to exactly pick the ammo that's purpose precise for that gun, it'll shoot most loads in pretty much the same place, which is phenomenal for a handgun. Because the barrel pretty much stays in line, unlike a Glock or other common handguns i really like that and like i said my beretta is ridiculously accurate now a lot of people aren't going to be able to shoot to that level of accuracy but i'm blessed to be able to and i think it would be a shame to give that up you know, a lot of people will pick a glock 17 i've got a glock 17 next to my bed it's a great gun it wouldn't be my choice it would be a great gun if it was like you know covid mixes with rabies and it's like the end and i'm you know never going to be able to clean a gun again maybe it would be a better choice for that but I'd still pick the Beretta. In my opinion, the Beretta is as reliable and as robust. And far more accurate and far more elegant. You know, with these picks, even if it was just like the government's like, you can only have five guns registered to you now. Then I could still shoot competition with the Beretta. Would it be the best choice for me? No, it wouldn't. A 1911 would. But a 1911 starts tipping the scales where it needs a lot more maintenance. So if I don't know what the environment is going to be, I love 1911s. They can be as accurate and reliable. They can be far more accurate and as reliable as a Glock, but they require far more maintenance. They're kind of like the prom queen. They require, they're pretty high maintenance guns. You know, the extractors need to be tuned. They need to be replaced, things like that. So that would kind of put them out of the running, even though I like them a lot. I guess those are the five guns that I would pick, and those are guns that I own because I have done this thought experiment before, if I could only have one of this, one of that. I guess I'll start out with some honorable mentions. The 1022 has an honorable mention, a gun that I had that I got rid of during the last ammo shortage, and it is the Remington, I believe they call it the Speedmaster. It's an older gun, but it's a great gun, and it's semi-auto, but it will, unlike most semi-autos, it will shoot shorts, longs, and long rifles. I and mean, that would have a tremendous advantage in a lot of these environments. Even today, where sometimes it's hard to find ammo. It gives you a lot more options. You can shoot short longs and long rifles. And 22 short out of that long barrel, while not technically suppressed, is pretty quiet. And that has some advantages. Advantages I don't really get with the 1022 unless I single loaded it. Another honorable mention that I've never owned, but would be one of the lever actions, like the Marlin, I believe, 36s. Or the Henry's that they still make in 22. 
because, you know, those will also, as I understand, feed all the different types of 22 rimfire ammo. Honorable mention for the rifle, the centerfire rifle. I've mentioned it before. Would be the Ruger Mini 30. If you're not familiar with it, it's kind of like the M14 scaled down. They make the Mini 14 and 223 and the Mini 30. I think for this kind of thing, the Mini 30 would be better. It's 762 by 39. And when I say that, most of you think, well, why wouldn't you have an AK then? AK is a fine combat firearm. I carried one in Iraq. AK is a fine gun for what it is, but it's not a good crossover into the hunting world. The Mini 30, I believe, is. You can mount good solid optics on it. You can mount a good hunting optic on it. It kind of bridges that gap between tactical and practical hunting more than I think the AK ever could or would. And that Ruger Mini 14. You get 762 by 39, you get semi-auto, you get the ability to mount good optics, you can get it in stainless steel. That would be my runner-up if I did not have a SCAR 17. Runner-up for the shotgun, because Benelli's aren't, I wouldn't consider them super crazy expensive, but they're not cheap. If you were trying to do this and didn't have a ton of money, I really, I guess I would still say the Remington 870 with the caveat that you buy one used, you know, early 2000s or before. Before they started having all the problems. But if you can find an older Remington 870. Right now it's hard because they haven't made new ones in a while. They just I believe recently started putting out their newer version. Where they got bought out by somebody else. And I'm not going to recommend those. Because I don't know how good they are. They could suck. They could be awesome. They could be better than the old ones. But I'm not going to recommend that if that's one of the only guns that you have. If you want to get one and test it out and play with it. And you have another good reliable shotgun. Go for it. But I would still say the 870. If you can find an older one in good condition. They made them for a long time. There's plenty of them out there. I would say if you want to do something in kind of what I'm doing, get the police model with the rifle sights like I had on the LAPD. They're great. If you had to pick a fixed choke, I'd pick a modified. But if you can get one with adjustable chokes, I'd do it. We had those with rifle sights and a modified choke and buckshot, and we would practice hostage shots with them. Because, as you know, or as you probably know, inside like an indoor environment, that pattern pretty much stays in one big giant hole in double up buck, and you can make hostage shots with them, and we did practice that. That Remington 870. The Mossberg 500 is probably a better mechanical machine as far as an engineering standpoint. I personally don't shoot them as well. You might shoot them better than an 870. I'm not sure. But that's why the 870 would be my number one choice, and the 500, 590s would be my second choice. But they are also a fantastic choice. Don't forget about the Benelli Nova and Supernova, they're pump shotguns. They're not super expensive, and they're great guns. As far as the 22 handguns, I would really stick with a Ruger. And if you can get a Mark IV, get a Mark IV. The Mark One, Twos, and Threes are great guns. I've owned them. They really suck to clean, and they're super complex to take apart and put back together. If you don't need that headache, I would spend the extra money and get a Mark IV. It's one of the things where the newer ones really are better. If you disagree, if you have other options, please let me know. Write a review of the podcast and put it in there like a comment. That way me and everybody else can see it. If you want to write me directly, you can go to goodshepherdtraining.com. Check us out on there. Check out this podcast, the Alpha Male Podcast, and if you care about the important stuff, Simple Man Sermons, the preachings of a simple man called by God to share the good news of Jesus Christ. But go to Good Shepherd Training write me on there. I know I'll probably get some pushback on this, but I can't believe you didn't say NAR. Well, if you would have picked an AR, tell me why. Tell me which one. Tell me what ammo, what load. And justify it. And let everybody else know, too. Again, you can contact me directly. Maybe I'll read it. If you write me on GoodShepherdTraining.com, I'll almost certainly see it, God willing. But if you write it as a review of the podcast, then everybody will see it. I can't believe you didn't say the blah, blah, blah. I can't believe you didn't pick a Glock 19 with a red dot. Or or whatever your thing is. Then let me know. I I don't think that I'm a sole holder of gun knowledge in the... Gunfighter Life Podcast Arena. I think all you listeners probably have plenty to say and plenty of wisdom that I may or may not have. I'm not so vain as to think that I know everything or have learned everything. I did this podcast to share my training and experience from a Judeo-Christian perspective with you guys. You may or may not disagree. Again, let me know. GoodShepherdTraining.com For the tactical tip of the day, I'm not sure if I've... Talked about this load before, but for a shotgun, for buckshot, 
a revolutionary, awesome thing that's been around a while because I used it, I believe, uh, quite a number of years ago, and that's the federal flight control. Now, most wads are designed when the shot leaves the barrel, the wad pretty much immediately starts to peel back and lets the shot go. But the flight control wad is kind of reverse engineered so that the fins are near the back and it kind of keeps the shot in one cup, in the shot cup for longer, which gives you tighter, denser patterns. Now, I remember with my, I remember with my Benelli M1 Super 90, I could take a cardboard IPSC target, you can look that up, a cardboard USPSA target, I guess is a better thing because IPSC International uses a different target, but the USPSA target with the A zone, B zone, etc., I could, with my Benelli M90, M1 Super 90, which is an open choke cylinder bore, no choke at all, I could put it up with that load and put all the pellets of double up buck into that silhouette at 50 yards with an open choke. Now, a lot of people will say that buckshot range is far less than that, especially on like a white-tailed deer or something like that or a bear. But with that load, with the right choke, and those are not designed to be fired through a full choke because I understand that they're designed to be fired through a more tactical choke. So if you have a crossover shotgun, you know, open, improved cylinder, that federal flight control. Hornady makes one similar. I'm not sure what it's called. But I haven't really tested that one out. But the federal flight control, that's kind of my go-to buckshot load for talking double O. So anyway, that'd be the tactical tip of the day, the federal flight control. If you're not familiar with it, with that, man, I want to say watch and be ready because you're told to, because you're commanded to. Give some thought. Don't just buy the next gun because it's the next cool thing. There's nothing wrong with buying guns for having fun shooting and entertainment and things, but do you have your core? Do you have the ones that if that's all you had, you'd be like, okay, that's a, that was a pretty good choice. Nobody knows what the future holds, but if we know that throughout history, pretty much every civilization in the past has collapsed from one reason or another, if something were to happen, would you, would you be well set up? with the weapons that you have now. Now, weapons are just one tool. There are many things I think you should have, but that's not what this episode, this podcast is about, this episode. But give some thought, give some circumspection, think about it. With that, men, I want to say thanks and have a blessed day.